Hi everyone! In a previous video, we watched Ali Daba make a claim about a Justin Barrett who did a study at Oxford University about children who never learned about any type of gods innately believing in one god. Specifically, he said one god, not two, not three, but one. And he used this as a justification for why he innately follows one god and how that eventually led him to Islam as opposed to any other monotheistic religion. I wanted to talk about that at the end of that video, but it was a little bit difficult to track down exactly what Ali Dawa was trying to reference. It was just Justin Barrett, Oxford University, and some kind of study. There was no specific study mentioned, and it turns out that Justin Barrett has written a couple books and has done at least one study. I figured let's go ahead and try to find the study. It was behind a paywall, but thankfully I was able to find a free PDF version, which is what we're going to tackle today. If you guys want to see the overall summary, please check out the end of the video. There's going to be one of those chapter notifications there. Just to give us a little bit of background, Justin Barrett had received a title of Honorary Professor of Theology and the Sciences at a St. Andrews University School of Divinity but he has previously taught in places like Oxford University, University of Michigan, and others. So this is not someone who is specifically only taught in theological schools. Um, that is important. It's not as if people who work at these schools cannot do any type of unbiased research, um, but it does let us know a little bit more about him, you know, as in does he even have the credentials to be doing a study? And it appears that he definitely does. This was pretty much the only article that I could find, and this was posted, or sorry, published in a journal called Compass with a, there's different sections. This one is Religion Compass. It appears to be a peer-reviewed journal. There's a lot of different journals called Compass, uh, and this one is done by Wiley. This is the publisher is Wiley. Uh, all the links for this will be in the, the description below. The title here is Cognitive Science of Religion. What is it and why is it? So here we have it. We can see that it's the same author, University of Oxford, and we see here Religion Compass, and that was published in 2007, and the DOI does match. The DOI is a, like a unique um, indicator for a... It can be for a journal, but it's other, it's other stuff that can be done. Usually you'll find them associated with psychological journals, though, or journals of psychology. Anyway, I wanted to read this for two reasons. The first one is to put it out there for anybody that was interested in it and would just rather listen to it instead of uh, read it for themselves, especially because I've heard this study referenced or I've heard Justin Barrett referenced, but that was always it. It was something like Ali Dawa said, and I thought at that moment, you know what, let's just go ahead and read this thing. The second reason I wanted to do this is because not everybody knows how to read scientific journals, so I wanted to just go ahead and show you how to do that. Um, you would think it's straightforward, right? Just start at the beginning, and that is not the case. So you do want to start with the abstract. We start here because we want to make sure that we're reading something we care to read. So sometimes you can read the title and you're not really sure, is this what I am actually interested in? So this is why you read the abstract. The abstract should contain all the information. It should contain hypotheses or it should contain the purpose of the research. It should contain a bit about the methods that were used. And then it also should contain the conclusion. So what were the results and you know what did we, what did we interpret from those results? So let's go ahead and try that here. Cognitive science of religion, CSR, brings theories from the cognitive sciences to bear on why religious thought and action is so common in humans and why religious phenomena take on the features that they do. Great. So that brings out a first great sentence, I would say. We're starting off um, just explaining, you know, what, we're, what the whole purpose of this paper is. Cool. The field is characterized by a piecemeal approach, explanatory non-exclusivism, and method methodological pluralism. So for this, uh, we're talking about just ideas kind of coming together. There's not one way to really look at this. Um, explanatory non-exclusivism. There's exclusivism and inclusivism when it comes to how we approach religion. 
exclusivism is just to basically say there's like one answer, one God. I would say something like Christianity or Islam. These are exclusivist religions. And in those cases, uh, it is interesting that it's written as explanatory non-exclusivism as opposed to explanatory inclusivism. So perhaps we're looking for something that's sort of in between or not necessarily inclusivism. And methodological pluralism is basically, there's not one way to test this, so we're going to check out a bunch of different ways that other people have tested this. So, okay, that's cool. Topics receiving consideration include how ordinary cognitive structures inform and constrain the transmission of religious ideas, why people believe in gods, why religious rituals and prayers tend to have the forms that they do, why afterlife beliefs are so common, and how human memory systems influence socio-political features in religious systems. So it just looks like it's letting us know what's going to be in the paper. And at the end here, it says CSR is often associated with evolutionary science and anti-religious rhetoric, but neither is intrinsic nor necessary to the field. So we're not really getting a conclusion here. Um, so sometimes you want to check for the last section. The last section should say conclusion. It looks like we're getting notes. We have a short biography, so we'll scroll up a bit. Clarifications and conclusions. All right. The summary above tends to demonstrate that CSR is characterized by three substantive tendencies that may contribute to its growing uh, prominence. The piecemeal approach, explanatory non-exclusivism, and methodological pluralism. Now notice we did get that in the abstract, and that's, that's very normal. Um, the reason that we read the conclusion is because the abstract lets us know this is kind of what it's about. Are you really sure this is the type of research that you want to read? So you kind of jump down to the conclusion to see from there, you read the introduction and how everything was done, um, just so you understand the conclusion better. Joining these three substantive factors, however, are at least two rhetorical ones deserving mention and clarification. First, CSR is often associated with anti-religious agenda. For, in for instance, books by Dennett and Dawkins parade findings from CSR as a part of their quixotic quest of freeing the world from religious thought. By no means does the cognitive approach or findings necessarily entail such a perspective, nor does it represent the personal position of many of those prominent in the field. Nevertheless, strident combative rhetoric, merited or not, attracts attention. Um, I mean, that's, that's good to say. I, I don't know if I would necessarily call people that I disagree with um, strident or combative. That's, yeah. Um, but you know, this is not my paper. Similarly, CSR has been closely uh, identified with evolutionary psychology and anthropology. Perhaps the ironic possibility of evolution not just competing with religion over human nature, but explaining religion as well, tantalizes observers of the field and participants alike. The relationship between CSR and evolutionary science is, however, more opportunistic than necessary. That is, CSR could explore how natural human cognition informs and constrains religious expression without explaining why human cognition is how it is. Such an explanation, perhaps provided by evolutionary psychology, increases the depth of CSR's accounts, but in fact, um, uh, but in fact amounts to a secondary project. To illustrate, specifying HADD's role in the prom uh, promoting belief in gods may help explain the recurrence of theistic beliefs, whether we, whether or not we know why humans have such a device. An evolutionary account of HADD amplifies the explanation, but is peripheral. At its core, CSR describes how human cognition is, not why it is, and how that explains religious expression. If that was a bit confusing to you, um, all this is really saying is that it appears that the CSR research has been um, added to or tried to be explained by evolutionary psychology, and it doesn't necessarily have to be at its current state. So they're saying that perhaps the research on CSR may just explain that it happens, not necessarily why it happens. But of course, isn't that the whole point of methodological pluralism to kind of come at it from a bunch of different angles? So it's, um, I would say this, this almost sounds defensive. This is sort of saying, listen, we've done this research and I don't like how it's being used. You 
don't always get to choose that. You know what I mean? Um, if people are using it erroneously, if they're making a mistake in how they're interpreting the information so they can use it for some kind of agenda, um, such as talking about human intelligence and then using it to promote something like, um, like Nazi <laughs> ideology, for example, that would be something to definitely clarify. And I would say defensiveness is warranted. But to say, hey, listen, we're trying to explain the what and other people are trying to explain the why. No, you're not allowed to do that. Please stop. Um, that's that's part of the point of evolutionary psychology is to give us the why. You know, so we have, OK, we have observed anxiety disorder is. Can evolutionary psychology explain why it is? We've determined that depression does happen. Can evolutionary psychology explain why this is something that has stayed in the population? So that's kind of the like one of the reasons I like evolutionary psychology. Um, it's not what I'm specializing in, but I, I like it for that reason because it, it comes at it sort of a, okay, well, we have these different attributes, you know, in our personalities and such. Uh, is there a reason for this? You know, so I really like that. So I think it's a bit odd to say, no evolutionary psychology, let go. This isn't for you. Um, I don't know. Again, it seems a little bit... I mean, this conclusion is supposed to be about the findings, not about let go of this. I think I would phrase it more like, sometimes you will find in the conclusion section, there's a limitation of the study. And it just tells you that the study can do X, but it can't do Y or Z. Those things need to be tested in the future. I would have maybe included that, such as um, limitations include that CSR explains the what, but not the why. That, that might have been a better way to phrase it, I think, to make it sound a little less combative. And again, I might be coming at this biased, so I'm sure there's a bias that I have here. To conclude, although a number of factors have undoubtedly sped the blossoming of CSR over the past 15 years, three scholarly substantive factors, a piecemeal approach, explanatory non-exclusivism, and methodological pluralism, and two unnecessary rhetorical ones, anti-religious tone and connection with evolutionary sciences, may have contributed. More importantly, perhaps CSR works. It does not merely offer useful analogies or interpretive frameworks or new tools for richer descriptions of religious phenomena. Rather, CSR offers empirically testable, theoretically motivated, scientific explanations for why religious thought and actions tend to develop and spread the way they do. Cool. So that's that's what we expect to read. Um, I do want to note we've got our biology or sorry, our biography here. Okay, that's fine. Um, as far as I can tell. The Wiley publisher, I think, is in the U.S. Let's let's double check that. I think we can double check that. Just give me a second. The reason I wanted to check on where Wiley was, uh, where, where Wiley publishes out of, which is in the United States, out of the state of New Jersey, is because of something I noted when I was looking through this the first time. There's a section here called Works Cited. And this stood out to me because if Justin Barrett is an American um, psychologist, publishing in a like a journal that is in the United States and published in the United States. I was really curious why he didn't use the APA format. And I know that that sounds really nitpicky, but why? If there's a standardized format for it that even students have to follow, why would somebody trying to talk about something that's really... Um, you know, a really serious kind of thing. Why would they do it in this way? I, I guess, especially knowing that people are going to look at your, you know, they're going to make sure that everything is done correctly. You know what I mean? If you don't want to be scrutinized for the wrong thing, make sure that all the stuff is, is right. It's, um, you know, this might be sort of a, you know, a British way to cite it. I, I'm not sure. 
um, but it's definitely not MLA format. It's not APA format. I, I guess it could be Chicago. I'm not sure. But again, why why would you do that? Which is, um, I don't know, pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, you may notice down here he does reference himself. That's completely fine. People do that, especially if they uh, have done the research already. There's, there's no problem with that. Um, yeah, these, these look a little... It's just unusual. I've never seen this format. And again, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that it doesn't mean his, his research can't be good um, or that I'm some kind of format expert or anything. But it just, it just struck me as odd. This kind of an odd thing. So we're going to go ahead and check out the rest of, of this. If anybody knows what format that was in, please, please let me know. But again, it, it did seem weird. He's, he's in the U.S. He's, um, he's publishing in a art journal that's in the U.S. It's going to be peer reviewed by people in the U.S. I just, that's something like if I was peer reviewing it, that's what I would say. Hey, by the way. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. 15 years ago, there was no such thing as Cognitive Science of Religion, CSR. Only a handful of scholars independently using insights from the cognitive scientists to study religion existed. Today, CSR boasts dozens of authored and edited volumes, numerous academic units, and centers prominently featuring its activities in a scholarly association with more than 100 members, the International Association for the Cognitive Science of Religion. Findings from the CSR have attracted the attention of popular media as well, appearing in such places as the New York Times, Sunday Magazine, and Atlantic Monthly. What accounts for all of the attention to up this upstart area of scholarship? On the substantive side, CSR is a field that offers at least three attractive features for scholars interested in explaining religious phenomena. First, it avoids the age-old problem of defining religion, rather than specify what religion is and to try to explain it in, the, in whole, Scholars in the field have generally chosen to approach religion in an incremental, piecemeal fashion, identifying human thought or behavioral patterns that might count as religious, and then trying to explain why those patterns are cross-culturally recurrent. Great, we're off to a great start. If the explanations turn out to be part of a grander explanation of religion, so be it. If not, meaningful human phenomena have still been rigorously addressed. Yep, I agree with that. This piecemeal approach makes the field complementary to the activities of other religion scholars from many disciplinary perspectives, a stance of explanatory non-exclusivity. So here's where we get that idea that we can kind of describe it, um, and this will apply to different religions. CSR does not pretend to exhaustively explain everything that might be called religion, provocative book titles aside. Rather, it seeks to detail the basic cognitive structure of thought and action that might be deemed religious and invites historians, anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, and other religion scholars to fill in the hows and whys of particular religious phenomena. Unless they're in evolutionary psychology, apparently. <laughs> A third scholarly virtue that CSR presents is methodological pluralism in seeking out what constitute cross-culturally and historically recurrent features of human religious cognition Scholars in this field have turned to whatever data collection and analysis methods that appear appropriate to the questions at hand, including ethnographic, interview, historical, archaeological, computer modeling, and experimental, including cross-cultural and developmental techniques. Again, this is what we talked about, and that's great. I agree. In this essay, I illustrate, well, that's why it's an essay. I guess it's not a, it's not a research paper. I illustrate the presence of these scholarly these three scholarly virtues in CSR, the piecemeal approach, explanatory non-exclusivism, and methodological pluralism, through a brief summary of CSR's state of the art. Such a review is necessarily selective, so I apologize to my colleagues whose valuable contributions that I have been unable to include. As I was reading through this, I thought, you know what, this is just a lot to go through that's not necessarily going to get us any closer to what we're looking for, which is the claim by Ali Dawa that Justin Barrett made or found some evidence that kids that aren't taught about God somehow happen to believe in a monotheistic concept of God. Um, so what I'm going to do is just go ahead and just read these on my own, summarize them for you guys, and then provide the link so you guys can check them out for yourself. So in this section here, unifying theoretical commitments, um, what they're basically saying is that we had this idea before that humans are sort of a blank slate, that you just, you're born and... 
you're just able to produce information as it's fed to you. Um, so what they're talking about here is that no, it's um, some parts of this are socially constructed or entirely socially constructed. Um, you are not just processing information as you receive it in the moment, but instead you're going based off of other things that you've heard. You're relying on cultural contexts, um, meanings of words that you feel that they mean, um, that sort of thing. So it's not just a you're not taking information in and processing it in an unbiased way, I guess is the easiest way to say that, which is fine. And I think it's um, pretty, pretty helpful to look at through, you know, evolutionary biology, but I don't think that he wants to do that. Um, in this section here, there was an experiment or several experiments um, in the USA and India. And so Barrett had done some experiments pr uh, pr prior to writing this essay and basically was saying that um, they understand a god theoretically, but when they're asked to explain the god, especially to explain a story that they were told that's specifically missing pieces, they would fill in those missing pieces with an anthropomorphized version of a god. Um, they call these inferential gaps that they're filling in. My question here was... If the person believes in an anthropomorphic god or that god can take on an anthropomorphic form such as avatars with Indian um, or with Hindu culture in India and um, Jesus Christ, for example, you know, that would be a perfect anthropomorphic uh, example of a, of a of the Christian god. Um, I wonder if the person had previous stories that they were told and then misremembered that they heard that in the story they had just read. So rather than making these, um, making things up to fill in the gaps and not being aware, not, not saying that they're lying, they're just not aware they're making it up. I do wonder if they're kind of putting two concepts together to create a third concept. Um, and this was not really explained how they, they thought um, otherwise of it. So... This minimal counterintuitiveness, this MCI section here, um, this is kind of an interesting idea where, and I'll actually read uh, this section because, or part of this section because it is interesting. We can explain why some ideas or practices are so widespread by considering how human minds might be more likely to generate and transmit some ideas over others. Our naturally developing mental tools readily generate certain kinds of ideas we call intuitive regardless of cultural contents, or context. For instance, our mental tool for understanding physical objects assumes that solid objects cannot pass through other solid objects. If someone tells a story about someone being frustrated by a treasure being locked behind a closed door, all listeners understand the problem. The person cannot simply walk through the wall. So I, I like that. That's kind of an interesting uh, piece of information. That's all. So what they're saying here for this minimal counterintuitiveness concept, however, is that ideas that don't seem to be intuitive tend to transmit better. So one idea or one example that was given, compare the idea of a barking dog that is brown on the other side of the fence to a barking dog that is able to pass through solid objects on the other side of the fence. The first dog is wholly intuitive and excites little interest. The second dog is slightly or minimally counterintuitive and is consequently more attention demanding, but without overloading online conceptual systems. So this is basically just saying we're more likely to remember this dog um, because it's, uh, it's, it's not something we would expect to find in nature. So that's kind of interesting and that's what they're talking about here. So here's where this kind of comes together with cognition and gods. A cognitive science perspective offers a theoretically motivated working definition for a god, a counterintuitive agent that motivates actions, provided its existence is believed in. Gods, ghosts, ancestor spirits, devils, witches, and angels would all count as gods under such a definition, but powerful human leaders, rock stars, and athletes would not, no matter how much they are worshipped, adored, used as role models, or inspire the information of cohesive communities. Perhaps the earliest cognitive treatment of a religious domain was anthropologist St Stuart Guthrie's revival of the anthropomorphism theory of why belief in gods is so prevalent. Guthrie argues that humans have a perceptual bias to attend to human-like forms or other information that might be caused by human-like beings. 
he casts the argument in terms of an evolved tendency that provides false positives for the sake of survival. So um, you guys have probably all heard this idea is that the rustling bush, if we assume that it's just the wind, but it's actually a lion, then we're, we're going to get eaten by a lion. But if we assume it's a lion and we run away, but it was actually the wind, well, you know, that's fine. We're still alive. If we assume it's the wind and it's the wind, we're alive. If we assume it's a lion and it is a lion, we're alive. So it, it's better to assume that the bush is moving because some entity, in this case a lion, is causing it to move as opposed to some accident such as the wind. So I'm sure you guys have all probably heard that um, as well. This cognitive system responsible for detecting intentional agency is the hypersensitive agency detection device. This is the HADD. Although determining whether HADD delivers false positives in the case of detecting spirits, ghosts, and gods is to make metaphysical commitments, HADD certainly merits the hypersensitive labeling because it does not require a human form or very much information for the HADD to detect something as an agent. Ex experiments with infants suggest that HADD is active in the first five months of life and only requires self-propelled and purposeful looking movement for it to identify colored discs as agents. So pretty interesting stuff. Um, one idea that I liked here was they said, you know, why do we sometimes think that the bump in the night is just the wind and sometimes decide it's a ghost? Do people really often have experiences that they then take to be direct presence or action of God? Even though these concerns challenge the sufficiency of HADD for explaining why people believe in gods, undoubtedly HADD may, I'm just going to call it the H, <laughs> undoubtedly the H may play a role in encouraging the spread of ideas about or belief in gods, counterintuitive agents that motivate actions. As Guthrie suggested, an experience of the H of detecting agency may fail to be rejected as irrelevant and may motivate the postulation of the MCI god. So this is saying that the HADD catches everything. So this can just create a bunch of ideas that, oh, God did this and God did this and God did this. So this was done by spirits and this thing was done by ghosts and this thing. So essentially we can almost boil everything that we can encounter without a ready explanation. We can just put, oh yeah, God did it. So I, I guess this is where we can talk about the God of the gaps, logical fallacy. Um, this is, uh, seems to be very associated with that. This section here called psychosocial reasoning, this is basically just saying, all right, well, if we can assume that there is a God that's responsible for this, then we can also make other leaps. Um, and the example that they gave here was the gods are angry with my cousin and so have afflicted him with illness. So now, it's not just, oh, I heard something in the middle of the night, maybe it's the devil, but now it's somebody is ill, and so we're kind of filling it in. Oh, it must be because the gods are angry with my cousin. So that's, that's kind of interesting in this section. Now here's the part that we really care about, and this is the whole reason we're reading this. This section is called Born Believers. In addition to the numerous ways in which God concepts may enjoy horizontal transmission advantages within and between groups, research suggests that children's cognitive systems may be especially receptive to certain God concepts. Indeed, Tamber Kellerman has even suggested that children may be intuitive theists, and Paul Bloom has proclaimed that when considering the developmental evidence, religion is natural. As summarized by Kellerman, evidence from British and American children demonstrates that children have a strong bias to see the natural world as purposeful, even in ways that religiously committed adults would never deliberately teach their offspring. For instance, children are inclined to say rocks are pointy, not because of some physical processes, but because being pointy keeps them from being sat upon. This prom uh, promiscuous teleology extends to living and non-living natural things. Recent research suggests that even 12-month-olds understand that only intentional beings create order from disorder. Not surprisingly, then, children have a strong bias to see the world as purposefully designed, but designed by whom? Now, this part, I really felt starts to get into... I don't know how to... Um, I feel like we're, we're sort of 
placing our ideas on top of children's developmental psychology. Um, so uh, Bennett here, he or Barrett here, um, he 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 cites uh, Jean Piaget. And so Piaget is very famous um, in psychology for having these different stages of development. So it's stuff like uh, object permanence will start at a certain age, um, being able to realize that other people have different perspectives, not just intellectually, but also just visually different perspectives um, that starts at another age. Um, understanding that if I try to find an object and I'm successful the first time, it's under uh, you know, colored cloth A, then the second time it's not necessarily going to be under colored cloth A. I can check under A, but if it's not there, then I should check under B, C, D, etc. Um, that if something's hidden, it's not always going to be hidden in the same place. That is, these are stages of development. And this is something that I, when I was reading this, I thought, of course a child would say that rocks are pointy, not because of a physical process, because pointy things keep them from being sat upon. Children think about themselves all the time. That's, that's how children work, and that's one of the <laughs> parts of my job as a person who teaches teenagers. Um, this is something that I have to kind of try to transition the students you know, into understanding that the world does not revolve around you. You are now roaming into an adult you are going to be judged the same as every other adult. Mom and dad love you. The rest of the world does not. They might like you, but they're not going to treat you special, you know. Um, but this is, the child is going to relate the rock to themselves. Of course they are. That's, that's how they think. This doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily believe in a God unless you tell them. And one thing that was kind of interesting was that, uh, Ali Dawa and other people that have cited um, the, they have allegedly cited this study because they've never mentioned the study specifically by name, um, only the author. But the people that are citing this essay, they, they mention that these children have never encountered any type of theology, yet these are British and American children. Are you telling me that these British and American children never had this idea of a God? Ever? Ever. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a god, I, I would say, like, a, like an all-knowing creator deity. I remember, you know, when you're a little kid and you've got siblings, you guys all take a bath together. And so as the bath was draining, we would kind of sit there and put our ear to the bottom of the bathtub. And we would hear the sounds that the water made as it was trickling through the pipes. And it was making this, this almost clinking sound. And so we decided that these are the Jinjins. I don't know where we came up with the name. And that the Jinjins, um, they're like little dwarves that live and work in the, um, in the drain. And that they're the ones making sure all the water gets out of the drain and goes away. That's the Jinjins. That's, that's because we didn't understand how water and pipes and gravity work. So we thought there has to be somebody doing that. Um, the same when I was, you know, still young and I saw that the light would go green, yellow, and red uh, for the traffic light. I thought, because I couldn't really understand the perspective, I thought there was a person inside of the traffic light and they were working there. And anytime, and they had to watch like all the cars, they had to watch the cars and that was the green light. So they're watching the cars, making sure everything's okay. But if they want to take a little break, take a bite of a, a sandwich or take a sip of a, of a water or something, um, they can't look at the traffic. So they have to tell the traffic to stop. And that's why they would change it to red. So when it's red, the little worker inside of the traffic light um, they're either taking a bite of a sandwich, they're stretching or walking around or going to the bathroom or something. And that's what I thought was, was happening. And I was raised in a religious household. So even though these are things that I'm trying to explain um, without understanding what's actually happening, without understanding how traffic lights work and how, you know, how, how water pipes work, I still didn't come up with, this is a all-knowing God. It's Jesus Christ himself doing this. Um, and I, that's what I, I feel like 
I don't think that what I, uh, I don't think that my childhood was remarkable in that sense. I've heard other people talk about their childhoods and how they've attributed, oh, I used to think that this thing, oh, that, that there was somebody who could do this. Uh, one of the reasons that we believe in Santa Claus as kids is because we don't understand that there's not a magical way that a person can get inside your house without a chimney if you don't have a fireplace, for example. You think when you're told, oh, there's a little pipe or a vent, Santa can get through there. I remember telling my second grade students, so these are about eight years old, uh, we were having a little Easter day and I told them that, oh, there was a little white rabbit in here and he was putting little gifts. You guys should go find the little gifts. They wanted, I wanted them to do like an Easter egg hunt. All the other classes, no problem. But the second graders in particular wanted to know where the rabbit went. And I said, oh, he's, he's disappeared. Magic. It, it, it just go look for your chocolates. <laughs> and they were really set on needing to know where the rabbit went. And we happened to have this broken tile in the ceiling. And it had this little gap about this big in there. And they said, oh, I bet he went through here because they were all waiting outside. They knew he didn't go out of the, the door. There's only one door in and out. So they, they decided, oh, he must have gone through the ceiling. And so instead of looking for chocolate, all the little kids were gathered at the ceilings looking up and some of them saw him. Now remember, there's no rabbit up there. There's nothing up there that looks like a little white rabbit at all. But there's children that are saying, oh, I see him, I see him, and everyone else starts screaming, I see him too, I see the rabbit. This is just how kids are, you know what I mean? So to sit here and say, ah, oh, yes, they're doing this because all of us are inherently monotheist. I, I just think that's such a... I, I don't understand why anybody would assume that. I really don't. And if you're a person watching this because you were told by some apologist from your religion, such as Christianity or Islam, and you were told, oh yeah, uh, this guy from Oxford University totally proves that kids are inherently monotheist, and now you're seeing this, I want to know what you think too. Because I feel like, you know, this, this was, um, you know, yeah, it's good to read different stuff. But if I'm looking for something that is what Ali Dawa said, this is not what Ali Dawa said, is it? Not at all. And this, this is a problem, right? Again, he, he doesn't even quote or cite the essay. He doesn't cite any of his books. He just says, oh, this guy showed this is true. That's not what I'm seeing here. Um, let's see. So given these experimental findings, it would not at all be surprising that children would readily latch on to the notion of a creator god or gods. I agree. If we tell a kid that God does magic, then they're going to say, okay, but even as children, we understood there was God and there was Santa. And then based on actually my cultural, uh, different cultural upbringing, I was in the U.S., but we still had our like traditional culture we had the difference between God and Satan and Jesus and then like our ancestral beliefs and like how the ancestors behaved and did cruel things. And I remember asking my mother, you know, if you're having this encounter with the, like a negative entity of the ancestral collective, then why not just pray to Jesus? Now I didn't phrase it that way because yeah, I was like five or six years old, but I was just trying to make sense of this. You know, can't you rebuke it in the name of Jesus? And my mom said, oh, no, 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 it's not the devil. It's different. Okay, but wouldn't it still work? Doesn't, is, can Jesus do everything? Yes, but not that. Okay. And if you have a mixed background as well, um, I'm curious if, if something similar happened to you. I'm thinking about doing a video by, by itself on that. Um, children also appear ready to believe in a super knowing and super perceiving God. Well, I mean... Maybe, you know, like, for example, especially if a child is still in that stage where they don't realize that other people have other perspectives. If a child is looking at, let's say, a bowl of cookies, big cat hair puff there, a bowl of cookies, they see that they're eating it and they might look around and not notice anybody, right? 
They don't see mom or dad hiding. They don't see auntie or uncle hiding anywhere. They don't see anyone. They believe they're alone. But there might be, you know, an adult peeking around a corner when the kid is not aware. So later on, let's say 20 minutes later, the cookies have been eaten and the parent says, ah, I know you did this. The child is going to wonder, how did this happen? And so a lot of common phrases, especially in places like the U.S., is I have eyes in the back of my head. And some kids really think that's true. Like, wow, mom can see more, like she can see forwards and backwards. That's why I got to watch out. Or um, the elf on a shelf idea, right? Where you have to be good because the elf is going to watch you and report back to Santa. Um, at least I think that's how it works. I've never had the elf on a shelf. Uh, Santa Claus as well. Oh, you better, you know, this is, this is one of those things that Santa's going to put on his naughty list, right? So of course they're going to be ready to believe in a super knowing and super perceiving God because they don't understand how you know the things that you know. I mean, a parent or any other adult is almost like an infinite knowledge well, right? Because they're able to predict things such as uh, if I balance something this way, the pencil won't fall. And then they show the kid and the kid's like, how did you know this would happen? Oh my God, how did you know? Right? But of course, with an adult, you've had this experience, you know how to balance a pencil so it doesn't fall. Um, but for kids, it just blows their mind. Uh, same with stuff like little easy sleight of hand magic tricks, right? I actually did this yesterday. I had a very small chili pepper and I pretended to eat it. And then I, of course, hid it in my hand. And then I pretended to cough or sneeze. And then I, I made it look like I was pulling it out from my eyeball. And the older child was like, heh, cute. And pretending to do it herself. She knew what I was doing. But the younger child was like, oh, just gasped. He couldn't believe that I was able to pull a chili pepper from out of my eye after I chewed it up and swallowed it. He just couldn't understand it. Um, so this idea that, that adults are magical, that adults can super perceive, and that there might even be something bigger that perceives even more, this, this is not a big leap here. <laughs> this is a child's understandable but profound ignorance of the world. And to say, oh, therefore, they're ready to believe in God, I would actually say that is an exploitation, an unfair exploitation of a child's um, naivety. You know what I mean? Barrett and colleagues demonstrated that children younger than eight or nine years need not strictly anthropomorphize God, a position advanced by many researchers in the Piagetian tradition. At least when it comes to mental properties such as perception and beliefs, children as young as four or five may hold markedly different expectations for God and people. Sure, of course they do. <laughs> Across a series of experiments, Barrett and his collaborators replicated a standard finding that children presume others' beliefs and perceptions are a reliable reflection of what the child knows to be reality, just as I explained. So this is a really good example. So if a three-year-old knows that a cracker box contains rocks, so would his mother, a bear, God, or anyone else. Hence, three-year-olds answer correctly, theologically speaking, for God, but incorrectly for mother by age five. They know that beliefs are fallible. So really what this is saying is a child doesn't understand that other people have other perceptions. They don't. It, they have to be at a certain age. Um, so a good example of this would be... Um, oh. This Jehovah's Witness book that I have right here that I'm going to read eventually. Uh, it's called The Secret of Family Happiness. And on the front, it has a picture of four people. We can assume they're part of a family. And on the back, we've got some writing. Okay, that's all we care about. The front is a picture. The back is writing. Now, I can show a child both sides. There's a front side that's got picture, back side that's got writing. Okay, cool. You, viewer, are the child, okay? And so I'm showing you the picture side. Therefore, I can see only the text side. If I ask a very young child, what do you see? They say, a picture. And I ask them, what do I see? They say, the same picture. Now, they're not going to phrase it that way, but that's what they're going to describe. That we both are looking at the same picture, even though obviously I cannot see this picture 
I can only see the text. So that's what they're talking about with the three-year-old knowing that the box contains rocks. They assume everybody knows that because everybody knows the same stuff that I know, right? They don't realize other people have other thoughts. But once you get a child again by age five, if I show them the same book in the same way, I can ask them, what do you see? They say the picture and I say, well, what do I see? And they say the writing. So in the same way with this box example, um, they're going to say, I know there's rocks here in the box, but Ms. Lemon doesn't know that there's rocks in the box. But if you already explain to a child that there's an all-knowing entity, and then you ask the child, does the all-knowing entity know that there's something in the box that's rocks? The child will say, well, of course, because that's what you already set up. That's like saying, I can't fly, you can't fly, but Superman can fly. Let me tell you a story about Superman that contains his flight. Then after the story, I'll ask the child, can you fly? And the child will say no. And I ask, can Miss Lemon fly? And the child will say no. And I ask, ah, but can Superman fly? And the child will say yes. Now that doesn't mean that all children have an inherent uh, inborn belief in flight achieving Kryptonians. It just means that we've already explained to them that this is a thing that is true or this is a characteristic of a character. So if I'm going to ask you a follow-up question within that context, they're going to say, well, yes, whatever the characteristic is. So if I tell you there's a God that sees everything and knows everything, does that God also know stuff that mommy doesn't know? Of course, we've already explained to the child that this God knows everything. So this, this is not, again, I don't find this, um, I don't find this profound and I, I don't, prof uh, I, I actually find this inappropriate. I really do. The, the development, the developmental stage of children, it's, it's so tested so often, right? This is a very um, well understood phenomenon. And so to, to say, aha, we'll see, this proves that kids actually believe in God because after we prompt them and prime them to believe in God, ugh, they believe in God. That's all they're saying. After we tell a child to believe in God, the child believes in God. I, that's it. Um, and that's where sort of the rest of this comes in uh, for the rest of this section. So that part was a bit frustrating, um, a bit frustrating to, to read for me. Um, the rest of this talks about things like religious rituals. It talks about stuff like prayer, um, interesting concepts like spirit possession. And again, these are things that you guys can read. Um, I don't think that they're necessarily going to help us better understand the child section because that section has passed. So I wanted to touch on the beginning parts just because we need a little bit of that background in order to understand the section about children. But the rest of this, um, it's something that you guys can check out on your own. Um, but this, this, are, are you as, I mean, I, I don't, I try to be very neutral on this stuff. But I, I'm very disappointed. I really am. Because I had to go out of my way to try to find this. I had to find it, and then I did find it, and then I lost it, and it took me a hot minute to try to find this again, this PDF. Because Ali Dawa didn't cite anything other than a name and a university, which was one of the universities where um, Justin Barrett had, lit, had worked at, not even all of the universities that he worked at. And what did he say? That children, it proves that children are inherently monotheistic, which is why I'm inherently monotheistic, which is why I believe in Islam, right? And this, this idea is, obviously you can kind of see my bias here. And I don't mean my bias as an atheist, but more like my bias as somebody who has an education in psychology at the master's level. So for, for, for me, reading this and reading Piaget's um, childhood development stages and to see somebody just staple on this religious belief, I, I find that really inappropriate. I really do. However, I also do not find that even under the most generous interpretation, I do not find that this supports anything that Ali Dawa said. 
at best, at best, we might get to a concept of gods as listed here, which is a very loose definition of God. Uh, where do we have that definition? The definition of God uh, was, was quite, um, you know, vague. A counterintuitive agent that motivates actions provided its existence is believed in. Gods, ghosts, ancestor spirits, devils, witches, and angels would all count as gods under such a definition. So that's as far as we can get with this paper. And Ali Dawa is saying that Justin Barrett proved that children are inherently monotheist. Do, this, this is what I also find so frustrating. Um, he didn't explain any other part of the book or the, um, the essay, right? He just made this statement. Now, even if I wasn't going to read any of this on camera and I was just going to summarize it, I could not summarize it that, that sh abruptly. You know what I mean? You, you would have to have some explanation, some background information here. Uh, we can go through some of the conclusions and just how he doesn't like the fact that people are using this uh, through an evolutionary psychology lens for some reason, uh, finds them to be totally unnecessary to do this. Um, you know, it's, it's just, there's a section down here. Using evolutionary adaptist perspectives alongside cognitive ones is increasingly prevalent in contemporary natural scientific studies of religion. For instance, the idea of religious rituals as a form of costly signaling that facilitates reciprocal altruism and intragroup cooperation has been receiving considerable attention. Perhaps, too, belief in gods gains selective reinforcement because of its tendency to produce reputation-enhancing or pro-social actions. Additionally, an account connecting an evolved hazard precaution system, it's that lion in the bush we talked about, um, as to why people engage in ritualized behaviors in religious and non-religious contexts has, been recent, has recently been developed. Perhaps a genuine cognition evolution synthesis in which evolutionary accounts of subsystems that underlie religious thought and action how, and how particular religions thought, religious thought and action might have adaptive value will increasingly characterize the field. So it seems that at the end here, before the conclusion, he's actually giving a really good ex explanation of, of how the... Um, the cognitive science of religion and evolutionary science can work together side by side. So he's actually giving a great comment here. And that was one of the things that I found uh, reading stuff, trying to find information um, about, uh, about our friend here, Justin Barrett, was that I, I don't think that he's a bad psychologist or anything. When we see some stuff written by people that have a, a very heavy theological slant, sometimes we see a lot of jumping to conclusions that are not there. Um, even, even in this case, I, I find this section to be a bit inappropriate, but he may just be just explaining what is as opposed to why is. So he may just be saying, yeah, so because of what Piaget said, we can see how it would be easy for children to believe in gods. But he might not be saying children naturally believe in gods, although I feel like he, he was saying that. So that's why I got a bit um, frustrated and said that it, I think it's inappropriate and it's exploiting um, children's misunderstanding of reality uh, to just staple on a god belief. But I mean, for the rest of this paper, I don't think there's anything um, necessarily wrong about it. I, I think it's pretty interesting stuff. It's, I mean, it looks good, quite frankly. Um, so I'm not saying that, that Justin Barrett doesn't know what he's doing. Um, I just disagree with this section that we are making, you know, that children have an understanding of God's creative power. Well, no, they have an understanding of a power that we told them a being has, right? Anyway, that's, uh, that's that. So I'm going to end this with a summary and uh, call it a day. So in summary, the essay is an interesting one about the cognitive science of religion. Where Barrett and I disagree is his section on children. He believes children have an innate understanding of an all-knowing deity, whereas I point out that they only have this idea because it was presented to them and then they were later quizzed on it 
such as God can do X, X happened, who did it, and the child will say God did it. Keep in mind that Barrett himself defined a God in such a way that, in his words, the definition applies to the capital G God, ghosts, demons, angels, witches, or ancestral spirits. This means that even if I agreed with Barrett's conclusions for this section of the essay, it in no way supports the claim from Ali Dawa that Barrett found children to be inherently monotheistic, especially from a wholly atheistic background, as these children were from the US and UK where religious beliefs are commonplace. With that being said, thanks for joining me today. Even if you were just here for the summary portion, I do appreciate you checking out my videos at all. So thank you for being here. If you wanna read the essay for yourself, there will be a link to the PDF in the description below and a link to the video where this was, this had been inspired by the video I did on Islam. If you wanna contact me outside of YouTube, such as Discord, Twitter, or Instagram, there's gonna be a link in the pinned comment below. And you can also help me out with some donations if you like, either a monthly donation on Patreon or a one-time donation on Buy Me A Coffee. Or of course, you can just comment here like, subscribe, all that other good stuff helps with the algorithm magic. And I uh, always appreciate that. So as always, guys, I want to hear what you have to say. And thanks for listening.